Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. Tasmanian politics, with its distinctive Hare Clark voting system, is decidedly different from the mainland. Through the early 20th century, the influence of Labor Premier Joseph Lyons shaped Tassie and then federal politics, culminating in his abandonment of Labor and ascension to the leadership of the United Australia Party and then Prime Minister of Australia. In the decade after Lyons' death, Robert Menzies would join with others, including renegade Tasmanian Senator Reg Wright, to form the Liberal Party of Australia. Joining me to discuss the role Tasmania and Tasmanians played in the founding of the Liberal Party is historian Stefan Petro. Welcome to Afternoon Light, Stefan. Thank you very much, Georgina. And Stefan, you've contributed a wonderful chapter to our book, Unity and Autonomy, which is a commemorative book for the founding of the Liberal Party, which is celebrating its 80th anniversary this year. And it's wonderful to have a Tasmanian chapter because it's a history that is rather untold, isn't it? And you've worked your life as a historian and based in Tassie, so this is something I think you'd feel particularly strongly about. Well, I do. I mean, I was puzzled why someone hadn't written about the history of the Liberal Party before, even non-Labor really before. And so I really want to make sure Tasmania is represented in anything that supposedly about Australia, that we're not left off the map. So I did suggest people who could do it more expertly, but when they couldn't be found, I decided that I should take on the mantle. (laughs) And I found it really interesting. And just as a background point, I found it so chaotic amongst non-Labor until the Liberal Party came along. They were coming and going, as we'll probably talk about. And I thought, This is quite amazing. How did non-Labor keep it together as it did until 1944-45 when things started to happen in a more organised way and a more directed way? I think they lacked direction. Well, indeed, and we'll get on to this later, but that's a familiar story around the country and, of course, at the federal scene as well with the evolution of different branches of the centre-right in Australian politics through political parties and different personalities and sub-factions. Yeah, it's a rollicking good ride till we get to 1944 and, of course, the stability of one political party on the centre-right really to this day. But just paint for us a picture, Stefan, of the Tasmania of the early 20th century and its political culture? Because this is, I mean, everyone loves Tassie, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful part of Australia. But it is unique and it's, of course, naturally distant from Australia given it's an island in and of itself. But its political culture is quite unique, isn't it? Well, it is. And one of the things I start the chapter with is Billy Hughes's comment in a Labor politician in 1909 that it was a, an anti-socialist paradise. And when you look at what he would mean by that, you could look at the immediate context and say, well, what he really means is that Labor was relatively late in starting in Tasmania, and not until 1903, hadn't done very well electorally before he made that comment. So that's on the one hand. So why didn't Labor develop? But on the other hand, the non-Labor parties dominated government, although they weren't really designated as parties very much before 1909, but they were renowned for their conservatism, they were renowned for their lack of progressive policies. The union movement, which would have been of interest to Hughes, offered some resistance to the status quo, but really didn't challenge the status quo. It was too undeveloped to really do that. And I think they were the immediate context for Hughes's comment. But if you look back into the longer history of Tasmania and Van Diemen's land, of course, it has to be a factor that it was a penal colony, that the lieutenant governors were autocratic. There wasn't any real talk of rights. Even local government took a long time to take hold here. I mean, municipal government, let alone running the colony in their own right. And yes, there were movements like the anti-transportationist movement, which really did challenge government successfully. And the Reverend John West, as well known probably to many listeners, led the anti-transportation campaign. And this was to stop the continuation of convict transportation to Tasmania, but to Australia. And it was successful. It was sort of Australia's first real kind of democratic experience, wasn't it? I think it was. I think it's probably understated amongst mainland historians, but I think it really was. But the interesting thing there was 
the whole mixture of people on both sides, but on the Victoria side, the anti-transportationist side, the autocratic wealthy landowners who'd done very well out of the colony really supported it because they wanted to control the government. And in the end, they did. This relatively small number of families really did control many of the early governments right up until the 1880s and probably. And they wanted to limit government. They didn't want any more centralised control. And so that knocked on the head any chance of doing anything progressive. And economically, they weren't progressive either. They wanted to make sure that they weren't paying any taxes that might benefit the rest of the colony. And then when we did set up a bicameral system like in other colonies in Australia, we did have a House of Assembly and we had a Legislative Council. But the Legislative Council is generally regarded as the most conservative of all the Legislative Councils in Australia at the time. They had a very restrictive franchise, uh, had the power of veto, could reject or amend bills sent to it by the Assembly. And we really didn't get even manhood suffrage in the House of Assembly until 1900 and for women in 1903. But the Legislative Council franchise was restricted to those who owned freehold the state of £10 per annum or owned freehold the state rather, and or you were an occupier of property worth £30. And that pretty much stayed in place. We didn't get adult suffrage in the Legislative Council until 1968. Wow. So really that sense of a land gentry who had the deciding vote on whether a legislation would pass or not. Yes. Their view was we're safe because there's no chance of a double dissolution of both Houses of Parliament. That wasn't written into the Constitution, which is a very important thing to have. The members who were elected there always saw themselves as independent, but also putting a break on anything that seemed modern or progressive. So it really was a house of review. And I guess the, the word that they often use was, we don't want any dangerous innovations. And often the things that were presented to them were not dangerous and not particularly innovative, but they still opposed it. So there's the political system that developed, which went into the 20th century, the period we'll be talking about. The other issue that some people point to as making for more conservative interest in Tasmania was the exodus of population. We tended to, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, but pretty much continued after that, losing population to the mainland. And of course, the normal argument is that it's the most vigorous and intelligent and ambitious people who are leaving, probably the people who would move and shake if they stayed. It's sort of a brain drain. Brain effect. drain. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's continue right up to the present. People tend to come back if they have children. They think it's a better place to raise children. But a lot of very intelligent young people leave. And so some people say that's a safety valve for the conservatism of the place and you don't get much radical protest. And of course, that also meant that the population grew very slowly. And it's staggering to think that even now we have, I think, what, 530,000, whatever it is. But by 1947, the population was still only about 270,000 for the whole island. (laughs) And also the population is very scattered around the island. Tasmania is a big island. It's not a small island. But to have only 270,000 people by 1947, that's pretty small. And it did mean that, again, a general argument from historians who've written about this say that the political and industrial conflict was handled at a personal level, not a societal level, not at a system level. And the other thing that often makes for attack on conservatism in other parts is that in the cities, they grow really big in Australia. We're one of the most urbanised countries in the world. In Tasmania, the two main cities were not very big. Hobart and Launceston were the biggest. Well, Hobart was bigger than Launceston, but they're only in the thirty to 40,000 range for most of this early period we're talking about. The other point is that industrialisation was minimal. We had very small workshops here until hydroelectric power developed, really from the First World War onwards. Unemployment was typically high and poverty was rife. So all those things combined probably explain why people like Billy Hughes said it was an anti-socialist paradise. 
Yeah, no, and I guess without that industrialization, industrial base, the trade union movement's ability to grow was limited because they were yeah. obviously developing out of factories and work sites and the like and organised labour really just couldn't grow like it did in Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane and obviously other parts of New South Wales and South Australia. But tell me, Stefan, the hair clerk voting system, it's very <laughs> much, you know, I <laughs> Always love it, like Anthony Green on election nights, always re-explaining to us mainlanders who think, what, what, what? But that's really important too to the story of Tasmania's political culture and political history. Tell me why and when was that introduced and what sort of impact does it have on the development of political parties in Tasmania? Yes, well, I feel we should bring Anthony Green now to explain it because it's so complicated. <laughs> I don't think we really need to go into the complexities, but essentially proportional representation system developed by an Englishman, Thomas Hare, in about 1856, and then modified by Tasmanian politician and later judge Andrew Inglis Clark when he was Tasmanian Attorney General. And I should say that, before I say a little bit more about Hare Clark, that Clark's work as Attorney General was in many ways more impressive than his studies of constitutional law, which he's renowned for, his work as a judge, and of course, his celebrated contribution to the Federation movement. William Dean called him the primary architect of the Australian Constitution. He helped draft the Australian Constitution. But in terms of the number and range of the bills that he had passed as Attorney General, he's at the top rank of Attorney Generals in the late 19th century. And in terms of our discussion, it's worth noting that he denounced autocracy and plutocracy, so the gentry, role in Tasmania, and was a pronounced Democrat because he said that democracy will not place as many obstacles in the way of people as these other forms do. And so he was very keen to redistribute political and material wealth. And really outside of the Labor newspapers, I didn't mention those earlier, but there were some Labor newspapers which attacked the status quo and the union movement. He was the most outspoken critic of the status quo in Tasmania. And so modified the Hare system to become the Hare Clark system. He was really wanting to break the oligarchy in terms of voting in single member electorates, which were quite small and a large number of them. And so he wanted to ensure that the voting system captured the preferences of Tasmanians. I don't think you can really be a Democrat unless you support a proportional representation system, because otherwise you are just ensuring the same people have power all the time. So in Hobart and Launceston, initially, there were multi-member electorates between 1896 and 1900. And then, of course, Clark was no longer in politics. He'd become a judge. So they reverted to the single-member electorates and first passed the post until 1909 when Hare Clark was reintroduced statewide and they set up five electorates based on the existing federal electorates. There were six members in each electorate and the average number of electors was about 20,000. And it's this issue of quotas, which we don't need to go into, but you have to get a quota under the Hare Clark system to be guaranteed of election. And in a six-member electorate, the quota was about 14.3%. So what that did was that larger electorates, as opposed to single-member electorates, encouraged cooperation between candidates from the same party. And it made a coherent party organisation more important in electorates. So if you just single member electorates, and there were no parties anyway, before the early 20th century, you can do it on your own. You don't need an organisation. And so what it meant was, whereas personality and connections still remained important under the Hare Clark system, if you had that party machine behind you, and you're cooperating with other members of your party, you're more likely to win than otherwise. Yeah, so your and argument is the Hare Clark system at the state level, it really fostered the development of political parties as organisations because you got this one electorate, six seats up for grab, yep. your party will want to win as many of those six seats as possible, not just the one individual who's local hero in Launceston or whatever or Devonport. Yeah, and, you know, I'm not quite sure how the distribution of preferences worked back then, but, you know, obviously they do work very importantly now. 
And the big change because of that statewide hair clerk system introduction in 1909, Labor increased from uh, seven seats in a house of 35 seats to 12 seats in a house of 30 seats. So that was a big change for the Labor Party. But the other thing about the hair clerk is it doesn't always result in decisive victories for any one party. So you often win by one or two seats. And if one member, as often happened in Tasmania, moved to the other side because they were disgruntled with their party, then you could change the government. We might come back to that when we look at a few other points about this. And you might gain most of the votes, but not win the majority of seats. So it does bring an element of unpredictability in some senses. And the other thing is the independents also have a good chance of winning. and Because they I only think, need to get 14.5% of the vote in one electoral district, yeah. So whereas that's they quite wouldn't possible, have, yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't have a chance under the single-member electorate probably. Very few independents got through it in the earlier system. And, in fact, between 1909 and 1950, there were 18 independents elected, and some of those held the balance of power because they didn't always hold the balance so, of power. So this is 18 independents out of a possible 30? Oh, no, this is across the whole oh, period. right, I see, yeah. yes, over the period, right. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. but it yeah. tend to happen at crucial times, as we'll probably discuss. Yes. But, yes, so the Hair Clark system was a game changer, I'd say, for Tasmania. And, of course, no one else, oh, I think the ACT have Hair Clark type system, don't they? and the Senate's proportional representation as well, but it hasn't really taken off. So you have the hair clerk system in Tasmania introduced in, well, reintroduced in 1909. And tell me about then, Stefan, the efforts to form a stable and viable centre-right political party in Tasmania, because this was pretty difficult, wasn't it? This was very difficult. I mean, I was staggered. They kept coming and going, these sorts of organisations. So as soon as Labor gets some seats in 1903, there are attempts to form centre-right or or non-Labor parties or interests. So there were about three or four early on in the century, Reform League in 1903, Nationalist Association 1904, and the Southern Tasmanian Progressive League in 1907. But the trouble was more like social groupings than really well-organised electoral bodies. And it's not really until 1909 for the reasons we just mentioned that Labor did so well, that a serious effort was made to strengthen non-Labor interests, centre-right interests, with the formation of the Tasmanian Liberal League. And this had the objective of state rights, preserving individual and collective rights of the people, and fighting socialism, which was a constant through the next few decades. And one of the failures for the earlier organisations was there was no connection between the outside parliamentary bodies and the politicians, whereas when the Tasmanian Liberal League was formed, the chairman became Premier Neil Elliott Lewis. So he was chairman and there were four MPs on the council. But the other thing that struck me about this whole period is that non-Labor interests were not solidly united. There could always be an issue where a number of people would desert their side it sounds and, like this hasn't changed much, by the way. <laughs> not in Tasmania, no. no. <laughs> or anywhere else for, for those, that matter. Those Tasmanian MPs at a federal level, Liberal MPs, still will, on a certain issue, differ from their political party and political colleagues. Well, yeah, again, it's another thing that come, runs right through, but the state's rights thing, whether you're Labor or non-Labor, that can be the decisive factor. And, yeah. you know, mention Reg Wright. Now, Reg Wright, we'll see later on, became a very staunch supporter of the Liberal Party, but he did become quite a rebel, often on the state's rights issue. Anyway, that's digressing. So what happened was some of the Liberal Party, as it became MPs, thought that Lewis was too conservative and they brought the government down over a finance bill and that enabled the John Earl Labor Party to rule for a week until the <laughs> Liberal members saw their senses, <laughs> got their senses back and But they persuaded Lewis to introduce some social legislation, some factory and wages legislation, to try and win over the working class vote. And so the Tasman Liberal League did become the first really effective 
centre-right organisation and they did quite well at the elections, the Liberal Party, you know, until 1914 when a single maverick, I won't even mention his name, but a single maverick went against the Liberal Party and enabled John Earl to come back in. And John Earl, Labor government, ruled for a couple of years up until the First World War. Liberal Party comes back in. What then happens? Plebiscite, the first plebiscite on conscription that divided <laughs> politics and Billy Hughes comes back into the picture. He was the Labor Prime Minister, but he was pro-conscription and so he left the Labor Party, formed the Nationalist Party. And so the problem then became, as it often was a problem, Liberal Party Premier in Tasmania, Lee, did not want to join a Nationalist Party run by a former Labor Prime Minister. Mm, and this would become a problem in the future too. <laughs> it became a problem. And, you know, it was staggering to think every time there was a split in the Labor Party and the leaders of that split went to the non-Labor, but the non-Labor people didn't accept them. Again, we'll come back to that. So the Nationalist Federation in Tasmania went on organising quite effectively and it became this silly situation where there's a Liberal Party in the Tasmanian Parliament, but a Nationalist Federation supporting a completely different party in different electorates that became the Nationalist Party in Tasmania. And the other factor that really struck me, I'm sure you're going to be interested in this, is that there were women branches of the Tasmanian Liberal League who decided that they would fight with the Nationalist Party to fight the second conscription plebiscite. And women play a role later on as well. So in the end, the Nationalist Party becomes the dominant non-Labor Party and really the Liberals sort of peter out. Is there a general acceptance then that if you were in the Liberal League, you would you'd go eventually to the Nationalists? I think so. I think they would because... Despite Billy Hughes tainting it. Despite Billy Hughes. No, I think it was, it was really more if you were for conscription... Yeah. Where else would you go? You'd have to go with the Nationalist Party. And, of course, a number of Labor people joined the Nationalist Party. In fact, John Earl, who was the Labor Premier I mentioned, the first Labor Premier, he joined the Nationalist Party. So the Nationalist Party, Premier Lee, who I mentioned earlier, who was leader of the Liberal Party at one stage, is now leader of the Nationalist Party. You think they're settling down into a longish period of party rule. What happens? There are some problems with members of his own party over financial management. The Legislative Council don't like his management of finances. Rural interests think that he's not doing the right thing by them. Economic growth is too slow. And so this resulted in a new non-Labor party, which is the Country Party. Now, the Country Party has never played a big role in Tasmanian politics, but it does seem to come in and out at different times. And this was one of the times. And the Country Party actually did its best at the 1923 elections, won five seats, held the balance of power, but then some nationalists got uh, upset with Lee and they split away. That enabled Joseph Lyons, the Labor leader, to become Premier. And Lyons became Premier from 1923 to 1928. And like Earl, he's a Labor Premier, but he's not a Labor Premier. He doesn't style himself. He doesn't emphasise the fact that he's a Labor Premier. He actually works well with the Nationalist Party led by John McPhee, and they even get the support of people like the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce says, we are so lucky in Tasmania that we don't have two parties fighting each other. They're working together. <laughs> and it was really true, and Hughes wanted to do that. And, in fact, there were really times where he really wanted to move away from any conflict or division. He thought it would work better if they were working together because the issue of socialism might be raised from time to time, but it's not a factor in Tasmanian politics. I mean, or... there's a policy speech that Lyons gives in 1925 where he spoke as a Tasmanian Premier rather than a Labor official. So he sort of is distancing himself from the Labor Party despite being a leader of the Labor Party and, of course, Labor Premier of Tasmania. So he's really styling himself more as an individual, which you saw in the early part of Tasmanian political history too. Yeah. Yeah, but then the Liberals sort of turn on him and realise that what they're doing by supporting him or not contesting him, they're consolidating him in power, and that's really 
not the name of the game in politics, you need to get control of government. So he moved to the federal level, Joseph Lyons, and it was part of the Scullin government, which, of course, had to deal with the Depression. But the Lyons and a number of other people didn't agree with Scullin's management of the economy. And so he left the Labor Party in 1931 and helped to form this new non-Labor Party, the United Australia Party, and Lyons became leader of the UAP, which is it's a wonderful story, really, it's isn't it? It's an amazing yeah. story, yeah. 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 And then went on to become one of the most successful conservative prime ministers in Australian history, certainly to that point, and probably you know overall. But what was happening in Tasmania? Did they all come behind the new prime minister? No. <laughs> Because the Nationalist Party initially gave the UAP in Tasmania, we're talking about, the cold shoulder and did not support it because they didn't want to be overshadowed by this new non-Labor entity headed by a former Labor politician and premier. And and this is interesting, Stefan, because around Australia, the Nationalists are turning into the UAP, but not in Tasmania. Not in Tasmania. No, they kept their distance. One factor that comes into it now is the Australian Women's National League, which was formed in Victoria, became very powerful, was formed in Tasmania, and they had a number of branches, and they supported the Nationalist Party, and the Nationalist Party really succeeded because of that support. I mean, women were really crucial in electoral fundraising and also in support and lobbying and so on. But then we're almost going back to the early 20th century here because you've got the Nationalists and the Australian Women's National League working together, but suddenly three new non-Labor entities appear. One, again, is called the Reform League, which really is interested in reducing the size of Parliament and the salaries of MPs. And then you get a Tasmanian branch of the wider organisation, the All for Australia League, which wanted to unite Australians to fight the Depression. And then you get a really interesting thing. I've never heard of this at all before. The Young Nationalists Organisation, which really wanted to spread the nationalist message against the UAP. (laughs) So at one point, you've got them fighting each other more than they're fighting anyone else. So the National Federation, the Australian Women's National League, the Young Nationalists Organisation withhold support from the United Australia Party, while the Reform League and the All for Australia League do insist that Lions be supported. And it's only when the Australian Women's National League breaks ranks and throws its support behind the UAP that the UAP starts to gain more support in Tasmania. But what you have is, in Tasmania, the federal elections were contested by the UAP, mainly because Lyons is the federal member for Wilmot, so that makes sense. While in the state elections, the Nationalists' label was retained. Right. Yeah. And tell me where else that has happened. I mean, maybe other historians will say, oh, no, it happened here, it happened here. But I don't know that it happened quite like that. And even when they came together, did they decide to form a new title for their organisation or go under one of the... No, they formed the United Australia and nationalist organisation in 1935. But the one constant, again, was the Australian Women's National League. They kept going and they became the most consolidated organisation over the 1930s and 1940s. But they didn't necessarily stop Labor from doing well at the federal and state elections. And we sort of discussed it. It's not only what disunity and the splits and so on within the non-Labor, it's also the Tasmanian Labor Party reflecting its electorate. Yes. So they know if you become too radical, you're not going to get anywhere. So they become more like, let's say, centre-left as opposed to centre-right, but still in the centre. Mm. And if you can't hold the centre, it's famous saying, isn't it, in politics, if you can't hold the centre, things just fall apart. And so Labor made the most of the scattered communities around Tasmania, picked, tended to pick local people who are well-known, where they had criticism on the left, they could say, well, we introduced some progressive policies, but the Legislative Council's too strong. We can't break that down. So they blamed the Legislative Council. And I found it very interesting. There was an article written by someone called Roger Scott, who is quite well known in political science ranks. And he looked at all the candidates and elected members of the House of Assembly from 1909 to 1959, 
And he showed that the Labor Party came from a wider cross-section of the community than other parties, and it was not exclusively a working-class party. So I think that's very significant. And Labor members tended to be, in the 1930s and mid-1940s, younger and intent on making a professional career of politics. And only 4% of Labor members came from trade union officials. 37% are from employer classes and significant numbers from farmers and orchardists. Yeah, it's very interesting and, of course, a very different development than on the mainland where the Labor politicians and members would in vast numbers be from the union movement. Stefan, I thought we'd get on to the the decline of the UAP at the federal level. Obviously, it fights the 43 election and does catastrophically badly and basically is is finished. And then Menzies and others really work hard to develop this new political party, which of course they do in 1944. Where was Tasmania in all this and Tasmanian politicians and political activists? What was the role they played in those years? Well, there's still that fear of this new organisation that Menzies set up taking over the existing UAP, but there's definitely a mood for change, especially amongst younger centre-right people, for example, younger members of the Bass Wilmot Divisional Council after the 1943 elections wanted to form a new party and completely sweep away, as they said, the existing UAP organisation. And a couple of people who are key factors. You've still got Damien Ed Lyons, who remains prominent in this period, in the 1940s. You've got the leader of the Nationalist Party, whose name was Henry Baker, and he attended that conference, that unity conference that Menzies held, where he talked about forming a progressive liberal party devoid of reactionary elements. And so even though Baker was probably on the conservative side, attended, was very enthusiastic about the fact that this new organisation could be established. And also Reg Wright probably summed things up a little bit and threw a warning shot across the bows of the United Australia Nationalist Organisation that we mentioned earlier. And he made it clear, I think because of his knowledge of what happened before, he said, I want to make it clear that the Liberal Party generally, but in Tasmania as well, was not a fusion of existing bodies, nor an uneasy relationship with old associations. That's what he said. And he said, it is in fact a new party which would draw its members direct from the electors who subscribe to the objectives of the party. And just in case people didn't hear, he then said, those who had called the Liberal Party the old crowd under a new name must now realise that the party was a new party containing no vested interests or prejudices. Menzies himself, when he set up the party at that unity conference, had said he was always surprised in Tasmania that there was a north-south division And so Launceston businessman James Fotheringham made it clear that regional rivalries would not be part of the new Liberal Party, has to be united. And the other thing that I thought was interesting, it said a lot for Baker, he came back from another conference and he was impressed with what Menzies said, we want younger members, even under 30, coming through. And so Baker himself, at least double that age at that stage, welcomed the contribution from the younger generation. So I thought that was very, very interesting. And other people kept hammering this message. It's new. It's different. And another person who really made a very big impression on me when I did this research was Stanley Burberry, who ended up becoming Chief Justice and and the Governor of Tasmania, but at this stage was a rising lawyer. And he said the Liberal Party would protect the rights of the common man against exploitation of any kind whether it came from big business domination or trade union domination. And one of Menzies' friends, Harold Bushby, another lawyer, said that the state council, when it's set up, will be the voice of the members. So it's really creating a different sort of entity from what we've had before. And Stefan, do you think, I mean, obviously Reg Wright and others are saying it's a new party, it's not just the rehash of the old guard or amalgamation of the all the different players who had featured on the centre-right in Tasmanian politics. But was that actually the case or did you see some of the same players from the UAP and the Nationalists take key positions in this new Liberal Party? 
No, well, that's when the rubber hit the road, as they say, when they started electing people to stand for parliament. And they tended to remove quite a number. I mean, they wouldn't remove, say, someone like Dame Enid Lyons, but she doesn't really come into this sort of thing because she stands above it a little bit. But they tended to go with Menzies' idea that you pick younger and, if possible, returned servicemen, Mm. stand at the federal and the state elections. The other thing that happened was a senator called Burford Sampson, and he was actually state president of the United Australia Nationalist Organisation, but also became president of the central Launceston branch of the Liberal Party. And he had heard that there was going to be a breakaway movement, and he said, no, I can guarantee you that we are going to dissolve, but we're not going to dissolve, this is the United Australia National, we're not going to dissolve until the Liberal Party actually win some seats in Parliament. So we'll retain the Nationalist Party So he's hedging his bets, basically. Hedging his bets. (laughs) But, I mean, the odds were, just because of the message that was being sent, the organisation behind the new Liberal Party, the choice of members, There was no way that the new Liberal Party wouldn't win seats. Any new party is not going to come waltzing in and winning a majority of seats and taking over government at one go. The best you can do is to make inroads. Now, they didn't make so many inroads the first federal election in September 1946, but they did reduce Labor's majority at the state level considerably. Labor was riding really high and they came down. And it was disappointing in some respects for the Liberal Party, but they could see that they were on the right track. And so the other party did dissolve. So we didn't have this thing where you've got this other non-Labor movement or entity still going while you're setting up this new one. They threw, as far as I can tell, and I would love to read some small primary sources to nail this down, but I don't get the impression. I think the Liberal Party became dominant pretty much from their first elections that they fought onwards. They didn't have to contend with another outside body. With the remnants of UAP or the like. What about the Tasmanian Liberal Party's, and I guess Tasmania in general's, attitude to Robert Menzies? Because obviously he's a Victorian politician. I mean, he's come out of Melbourne into the federal scene and he's not necessarily of Tasmania. So there was the history with Joe Lyons and it was complicated history. So how did Tasmanians view him? Yeah, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Well, look, again, it, hard evidence is elusive. I don't think there were any polls that asked Tasmanians specifically what they thought of Menzies. But I do think that Menzies was popular in Tasmania, despite those points you fairly made at the beginning. When In 1941, at the State Conference of the Australian Nationalist Organisation in Tasmania, his leadership was supported when it was coming under attack from his own side of politics. So that's one thing. When he came to Tasmania during the 1943 federal elections and the 1944 federal referendum campaigns, yeah, he always faced interjections, interjectors, or interjectors were part of the landscape back then. But he was received enthusiastically by large audiences throughout Tasmania. When Reg Wright returned to Hobart after the October 1944 conference, he told his daughter, Alison, well, we've elected Bob Menzies as leader. I think we've done the right thing. So not a huge endorsement, but still an endorsement. He didn't say, oh, it was a terrible decision. And, of course, Menzies came to Hobart to help set up the Liberal Party, which I think is a very important factor. and. There were people who were echoing Menzies' views, not just about being a new political force, but but looking after the forgotten people that was used a few times in Hobart. But I, I mean, Menzies was wonderful, as we all know, at responding to interjectors, and he had a really raucous meeting in Launceston in September 1946, and some loud interjector he responded to this way. The strength of your voice does not compensate for the weakness of your mind and things like that. You know, so the only thing I found which was really interesting, he made a comment in Launceston because it was so rowdy that he said, I'm not addressing the descendants of convicts, but free Australian citizens. Now, that wasn't reported in the Tasmanian newspapers, but it was reported in the national newspapers and the local Labor Party Secretary 
pointed it out in a letter to the advocate and said, oh, you know, this is a token of what is in store if we brought the feudalistic domination of a Menzies-led government. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not that. sure his logic makes sense there, but anyway. <laughs> He's going for effect, isn't he? Yeah. But, so I would say Menzies was popular yeah. in Australia. And I, I would say that his popularity, and this is in the 40s, looked internally into himself, didn't he, and was wondering what things were going to happen in the future. And, of course, it built on that in the 1950s and 1960s. So I'd obviously say. at a federal level, Stefan, the Liberals do very well. They win 49 and then they're really winning until 1972. So under Menzies, of course, and then his successors, they're doing really well. And Tasmania is important for Senate majorities that Menzies oh, yeah. was able to obtain throughout his term in office. So Tasmania is supporting Menzies through that period. But at a state level, the Liberals don't do well at all, do they? I mean, Labor's in government from 1934 to 69, which Mm. is extraordinary. And we do see long-term state governments across South Australia and Victoria too, so it's not without precedent. Of course, there's Playford and Bolte, but still this does demonstrate that at a state level, at state parliament level in Tasmania, the Liberals really flounder. Why do you think it took them so long until 1969 to win office? Well, it is a puzzle because, as I mentioned, the Hare-Clark system could at any time change the government, so it wouldn't take much. The future was uncertain for Labor in some respects. It was clean to power. It did rely on independence quite a bit. There were dissident Labor members. There was a hostile legislative council. It really was a puzzle that Labor could hang on The only reason I could say is, again, that it was centre-left, but probably not even centre-left, just centre. So it didn't upset the electorate with radical policies. So I think that's one reason, but from the Labor side, but from the Liberal side, when you look at the reasons people gave, they say that they didn't appoint the right leaders who could exploit Labor's weaknesses or cut through and win public confidence or sell party policies or develop more imaginative policies that would appeal to a broad spectrum of electors, which is what you had to do. I think we'd really need far more research into all that to really establish that. They didn't always select politicians who would hold the party line. So that was an issue and that caused internal dissension. To some extent, again, needing more research, divisions between the parliamentary party and the state executive. One sign that things weren't going very well was in the early 1960s. The country party comes back in briefly, but that's a sign that they weren't perhaps tapping into the rural interests, which, again, you need to do and Labor tended to do. One reason Labor did that was it spread hydroelectricity into rural areas, and that really changed the lives of many rural voters, and Labor got the benefit of that policy because they were in for so long, as you said. And there wasn't any really militant left wing in Labor for the Liberals to attack. They were outside the party, not inside the party. But then things do change in the 1980s. And again, it's you have to look at both sides. Why did it change? Well, if you look from 1982 to 2024, Liberals held office for 23 years and Labor 19 years. So that's a change. That's a flip on the previous period. And the Labor period, they had to rely on Greens for a number of those years. So if if you took that out, they wouldn't have been in government. That would have gone to the Liberals. So the Liberals really, you could say, dominated the period 1982 to 2024. And there must have been a combination of economic, social, demographic and political factors to account for that. But one reason that I put forward in the chapter was that there was a change in leadership, the generation of leaders in in the Labor Party became less conservative because they became university educated to a larger extent. They had to because they had to contend with the Greens, which were trying to steal their thunder. They also became much less a union party, I mean, in terms of union membership, such as it was. There was conflict between the left and right of the party, again, whereas I think the Liberals in this period adopted a or attained a moderate conservatism based on assertive pro-growth and pro-employment policies, which really had been dominated by Labor. 
They were expedient in giving some concessions to environmental concerns, but they kept a safe distance from the Greens. There was going to be no co-government with the Greens. And so to sum it up, I'd say that the Tasmanian electorate's predilection to vote for the most conservative option offered by a strong leader, I think the Liberal leaders, with a few exceptions, were stronger than the Labor leaders. It certainly wouldn't explain everything, but I think it can't be discounted as a factor for the rise of the Liberal Party from the late 20th century. Well, Stefan, that's been a wonderful discussion on the development of the Liberal Party in Tasmania and, of course, its contribution to the Federal Liberal Party and such an important one because I do think not many people would be familiar with this and we're really looking forward to the launch of the book, Unity and Autonomy, in October this year because it will be an important contribution to the understanding of this period of Australian political history. So thank you for all you've done and thank you for joining me on Afternoon Light today. Lovely. Thank you very much, Georgian. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook.